Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Jesus forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. Andrew brought good news to me. I could understand the Bible more the way he taught it. Jesus forgave you one time, and that's for everything. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. I'm drawing to a close on a series that I've been doing for four weeks. This coming Friday will be the completion of four weeks that I've been teaching on hardness of heart. And even though it's kind of a negative title, it's a really positive truth. If you understand that being hardened towards God means you're cold, insensitive, unfeeling, or unyielding in some area of your life, then I think everybody would have to admit that there's some area that we aren't sensitive to the Lord the way we should be. We're more sensitive to the fear and the unbelief that comes at us through the world. Then I talked about what causes that, and basically it's whatever you focus your attention on. It says in Mark chapter 6, verse 52, that the reason their heart was hardened was because they considered not the miracle of the loaves. If they would have kept their minds stayed on the miraculous power that they had just seen demonstrated through Jesus when He fed all of these thousands of people with just five little loaves and two fish, then they wouldn't have been surprised to see Jesus come walking upon the sea. But they had just been captivated and taken captive by the thoughts about how to survive in the midst of this storm. So whatever you consider, your heart becomes sensitive to. The word consider, again, means to study, ponder, deliberate, examine, meditate upon, focus upon. Whatever your focus is on, your heart just becomes dominated, sensitive to, controlled by that. Whatever you fail to consider, your heart becomes insensitive, hardened towards that. And so we can actually reverse this process and get to where we use it in a positive way that we are so God-centered that we honestly don't know how to disbelieve God. We don't know how to be depressed. We don't know how to be discouraged. (laughs) And I know that some people are like, that is not possible. It is possible. Don't wake me up. This is how I'm living. I'm not saying I do it perfectly, but this is my goal, and to a large degree, uh, this is how I live. And I was using the scriptures yesterday. We're talking about now, what is the cure for this? If you understand what causes the problem is just our focus is not on God. It's on these other things. And whatever you focus on, you become sensitive to or dominated by. If you understand that that's what causes the problem, then the answer is really just real simple. You just refocus. You get to where you put first the kingdom of God. You seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and then everything else just falls into place. But this is the key, is refocusing our attention and putting it solely upon the Lord. I was using Matthew chapter 6 yesterday, and I read all of these verses about consider the lilies of the field. They don't toil, they don't spin, and yet Solomon was never arrayed as well as one of these lilies. Consider the ravens that, man, God feeds them. They don't sow and they don't reap and they don't put it in barns, and yet God takes care of them. We are much better than they. And let me just back up on a verse that I read yesterday, Matthew chapter 6, verse 29. It says, I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these, talking about one of these lilies. A, A lily that doesn't do anything is more beautiful than Solomon in all of his glory because God takes care of them. And it goes on to say, Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And then look at this in verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And I want to just focus on this 31st verse where it says, Take no thought, saying... 
I've been talking about that the cure for a hardened heart is basically just to refocus our attention and put it so much on God that you don't even, you aren't sensitive to, dominated by, controlled by all of the negative unbelief, doubt, fear, negative things that come into our life. How do you do that? This says you take a thought saying it. This is telling you not to take a thought saying, well, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? But here is a great truth. The way that thoughts become strongholds in us is when we begin to speak it. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Your words have supernatural power in it, and the average person does not understand this. They don't believe it. Some have even heard it, and they rejected it, thinking that it's just not that important, because our society today does not put an importance on words. Man, they, they will sit there and lie. They will say things. I could get very specific, but we've got politicians today that are just lying out of both sides of their mouth, and they seem to do it without any conscience, any conviction whatsoever. And so uh, it's, it's not popular in our society. People say all kinds of things. You can even put it in writing, and if you have a good lawyer, that doesn't mean anything. You can beat it. You can, you can get out of these kind of things. So words aren't really that important in most of our societies today, but in the Bible, in the kingdom of God, they are super powerful. God never violates His Word. And if we violate our Word, then we are ungodly. We are not like God. And so how do you take thoughts? When you start repeating those thoughts and speaking them is when those things become strongholds in your life. I think it was Kenneth Hagin that I heard say that you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from building a nest in your hair. You can't always keep a thought from coming. Sometimes, you know, if the doctor tells you you're going to die, there may be a thought about, well, what would it be like with my family if I die? You can't necessarily keep a thought from coming, but you can keep from dwelling on that thought. And one of the ways you do that is not to speak forth those negative thoughts. You don't take a thought by saying it. Or let me rephrase that. I think I said that wrong. You take a thought when you say it. If you don't say it, then you don't take it. Now, you, you also need to control your thought life, but you can actually replace thoughts with your words. When you start speaking things is when things begin to start having influence and power on your life. Again, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can e either release death with your words by speaking forth the negative thoughts and the things that you have that are contrary to God's Word, or you can release life. It didn't say death and life and a whole lot of other stuff that doesn't matter. No, every word that comes out of your mouth is either life or death. There are no other options. And sad to say, most of us, like if a doctor gives you a bad report and people say, how are you? Most people, it's just like you throw up all over them. You just speak all of this doubt and unbelief. And somebody say, well, are you saying that then we shouldn't even acknowledge that it happened? I'm saying that there's no virtue in you just repeating all of these bad things. I am not saying that you say things that are as if they are not. Now, that's a play on words, but over in Romans chapter 4, it says God's kind of faith calls things that are not as though they were. That's the way God's faith. It may not be in existence right now, but you go ahead and speak about it as if it was already done. And specifically, that was talking about where he changed Abram's name to Abraham. It changed him from prince to a father or prince of many nations. And God called him that before he ever had a son. God's kind of faith calls things that are not as though they are. Some people have twisted this and tried to call things that are as though they are not. For instance, the doctor will say, you're dying, and somebody will say, how are you doing? He says, I am not dying. That is not true. Well, now you're calling things that are as though they are not. That's not what the Scripture says to do. But what you can do is sit there and say, well, the doctor gave a negative report, but by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. And you can turn around and use your words to take positive thoughts and to release the power that's in them. You know, I've gotten to where lately I've been saying, 
that if any germ touches my body, that my body is a germ graveyard. No germ can touch me and live. And I heard, um, man, I just forgot his name right now, but the guy that was in Spokane, Washington, that uh, anyway, he, he gave testimony about this, the South African that was there and lived back in the early 1900s. And he said that no germ can touch his body and live. And that's based on Psalms chapter 91. And uh, so certainly there's scriptural precedent for it. But you know what? I haven't always said those things. Lately, I've been saying that no germ can touch me and live. And you know, the more I say it, man, the stronger my faith gets in that. This is one of the ways that you change your heart from being insensitive towards God to being sensitive towards God is you start rejecting the negative things that you that have come your way, the things that have been spoken over you, and you start speaking positive things. You start saying what the Word says. You start speaking that, man, God, I am seeking the kingdom of God with my whole heart. I'm putting first the kingdom of God and everything else is being taken care of. So again, all of this I'm saying about how do you, how do you redirect your heart? How do you refocus your heart? Your words are a big part of it. You need to quit cursing yourself. If Jesus would have taken these little loaves and fish and if He would have cursed them and said, this is never enough, this will never work, there's no way that this can feed 5,000 men, not including the women and the children. It won't work. But then He said, well, Father, bless it. Well, then I guarantee you that food would not have multiplied. He didn't curse what He had. He didn't release death with His words. Instead, He looked up LAST WEEK I GAVE SOME EXPLANATION ABOUT THAT, BUT HE LOOKED PAST THE LIMITATIONS OF THIS NATURAL, AND HE BEGAN TO SPEAK POSITIVE. AND HE TOLD THEM THAT YOU SAT, THE PEOPLE SIT DOWN, I'M GOING TO FEED THEM ALL. AND HE SPOKE AND HE USED WORDS TO DIRECT HIS HEART IN THE WAYS OF THE LORD. YOU KNOW, I DO THIS IN MY MEETINGS. I'LL GET UP AND SOMETIMES I DON'T HAVE ANY FEELING OR ANY SPECIAL THING FROM GOD THAT SOMETHING SPECIAL IS GOING TO HAPPEN, BUT I'LL JUST START TAKING WHAT THE WORD OF GOD SAYS, THAT JESUS WENT ABOUT DOING GOOD, HEALING ALL THAT WERE OPPRESSED OF THE DEVIL, FOR GOD WAS WITH HIM. IN ACTS 10, 38, AND THEN I'LL SAY, HE THAT BELIEVES ON THE LORD, THE SAME WORKS THAT HE DID, WILL I DO ALSO. THAT'S WHAT IT SAYS IN JOHN CHAPTER 14, VERSE 12, AND BASED ON NOTHING BUT SCRIPTURE, I'LL GET UP IN MY MEETINGS AND START SAYING, TONIGHT WE ARE GOING TO SEE MIRACLES HAPPEN. WE'RE GOING TO SEE PEOPLE BLIND EYES OPEN. AND I'LL START SPEAKING THESE THINGS. AND AS I SPEAK IT, I TAKE THOSE THOUGHTS AND I REDIRECT MY HEART. I PUT MYSELF OUT ON A LIMB WHERE IF GOD DOESN'T COME THROUGH, I'M IN TROUBLE. AND THIS IS ONE OF THE WAYS THAT YOU DIRECT YOUR HEART TOWARDS THE THINGS OF GOD. AND ON THE CONVERSE OF THIS, IF YOU ARE SITTING AND LISTENING TO PEOPLE THAT JUST DISCREDIT AND SAY, MAN, PEOPLE WHO BELIEVE IN MIRACLES ARE ABSOLUTE IDIOTS. THERE AREN'T MIRACLES TODAY. THERE ISN'T A GOD. AND THEY ARE, THEY'RE, they're PUSHING UNGODLINESS and, AND PROMOTING HOMOSEXUALITY AND TRANSGENDERISM. AND IF YOU LISTEN TO ALL THAT STUFF, EVERY TIME YOU HEAR THOSE NEGATIVE WORDS, THOSE THINGS ARE BRINGING A HARDNESS TOWARDS YOUR HEART. BUT WHEN YOU START SPEAKING THE WORD OF GOD AND DOING THIS, YOU START BRINGING A SENSITIVITY IN YOUR HEART TOWARDS GOD. I TELL YOU, THIS IS REALLY, REALLY IMPORTANT. IT'S, it's SIMPLE. SOME PEOPLE THINK THIS IS TOO SIMPLE. THEY THINK YOU GOT TO DO MORE THAN JUST SAY SOME RIGHT THINGS. WELL, YES, YOU HAVE TO BELIEVE IN YOUR HEART. IT SAYS IN ROMANS CHAPTER 10, FOR WITH THE HEART MAN BELIEVES AND WITH THE MOUTH CONFESSION IS MADE UNTO SALVATION. YOU CAN'T JUST SAY THINGS AND THEN NOT BELIEVE IT IN YOUR HEART. THAT'S POWERLESS. BUT YOU CAN'T BELIEVE IT IN YOUR HEART WITHOUT SAYING IT EITHER. THAT'S POWERLESS. YOU RELEASE STRENGTH AND POWER THROUGH THE WORDS THAT YOU SPEAK. I HAD A MAN COME TO ME ONE TIME AND HE SAID, I AGREE WITH EVERYTHING YOU'RE SAYING. I BELIEVE IT IS GOD'S WILL TO HEAL ME AND I WANT IT AND I'M PRAYING FOR IT, BUT I JUST FEEL POWERLESS. I DON'T HAVE ANY POWER TO BRING IT TO PASS. WHAT DO I DO? AND THE FIRST THING I DID WAS SHOW HIM PROVERBS 18, 21. DEATH AND LIFE ARE IN THE POWER OF THE TONGUE. I SAID, YOU'VE GOT A TONGUE. YOU'VE GOT POWER RIGHT THERE, BUT YOU ARE SPEAKING DOUBT AND UNBELIEF. YOU ARE SPEAKING WHAT YOU FEEL INSTEAD OF WHAT THE BIBLE SAYS AND WHAT YOU BELIEVE. I SAID, YOU NEED TO QUIT CURSING YOURSELF. YOU'RE HUNG BY YOUR TONGUE. YOU NEED TO START SPEAKING THE WORD OF GOD, AND IT WILL LITERALLY DIRECT YOUR HEART AND MOVE IT IN THAT DIRECTION. 
AS A MAN THINKS IN HIS HEART, SO IS HE. OUT OF THE ABUNDANCE OF THE HEART, THE MOUTH SPEAKS. AND IF YOU WOULD BEGIN TO START SPEAKING AND FROM YOUR HEART BELIEVE THAT THOSE THINGS THAT YOU'RE SAYING, YOU CAN LITERALLY REDIRECT YOUR HEART TOWARDS THE LORD. LET ME USE, you, uh, use ANOTHER PASSAGE OF SCRIPTURE OVER HERE IN MATTHEW CHAPTER 17. AND THIS IS JUST A CLASSIC EXAMPLE THAT I USE A LOT. BUT JESUS HAD BEEN UP ON THE MOUNT OF TRANSFIGURATION. THIS IS WHERE HE TOOK THREE OF HIS DISCIPLES, PETER, JAMES, AND JOHN, AND HE TOOK THEM UP ONTO THIS MOUNTAIN. AND AS HE PRAYED, HE LITERALLY BEGAN TO RADIATE LIGHT. IT SAID IT BECAME SO BRIGHT, IT WAS LIKE THE NOONDAY SUN. AND AS HE PRAYED AND THIS LIGHT WAS COMING OUT OF HIM, THERE WAS A GLORY CLOUD THAT OVERSHADOWED THEM, AND THEY HEARD AN AUDIBLE VOICE FROM GOD OUT OF THE CLOUD SAYING, THIS IS MY BELOVED SON, HEAR HIM. THEY ALSO SAW MOSES AND ELIJAH THAT WERE THERE TALKING WITH JESUS. THIS WAS A GLORIOUS EXPERIENCE. AND THEY HAD BEEN UP ON THIS MOUNTAINTOP. AND WHEN THEY CAME DOWN FROM THE MOUNTAIN, THEY SAW A CROWD AROUND THE REMAINING NINE DISCIPLES, AND THEY WERE... Uh, YOU KNOW, QUESTIONING ABOUT WHY THIS BOY WASN'T HEALED. AND SO WHEN THEY CAME DOWN, LET ME JUST READ THIS TO YOU. IT SAYS IN VERSE 14, AND WHEN THEY WERE COME TO THE MULTITUDE, THERE CAME TO HIM A CERTAIN MAN KNEELING DOWN TO HIM AND SAYING, LORD, HAVE MERCY ON MY SON, FOR HE IS LUNATIC AND SORE VEXED, FOR OFTENTIMES HE FALLETH INTO THE FIRE AND OFT INTO THE WATER. AND I BROUGHT HIM TO THY DISCIPLES, AND THEY COULD NOT CURE HIM. MAN, THAT'S A SAD FACT. YOU KNOW, WE ARE SUPPOSED TO BE DISCIPLES. THAT MEANS WE'RE SUPPOSED TO BE LIKE OUR MASTER. WE'RE SUPPOSED TO BE REPRESENTING HIM. AND YET THE SAD FACT IS THAT THESE DISCIPLES COULD NOT DO WHAT JESUS COULD DO. AND YET JESUS HAD EMPOWERED THEM. OVER IN THE 10TH CHAPTER OF THE BOOK OF MATTHEW, HE HAD GIVEN THEM POWER OVER ALL SICKNESS, OVER ALL DISEASES, AND OVER ALL DEMONS TO CAST THEM OUT. SO THEY HAD THE POWER, AND THEY HAD THE AUTHORITY. THEY HAD THE COMMISSION FROM GOD TO DO THIS, AND YET THEY COULDN'T SEE THEIR FAITH WORK. THAT'S SAD. AND HOW DID JESUS RESPOND TO THIS? YOU KNOW, TODAY, AS I WAS SAYING SOME OF THESE THINGS ON THIS PROGRAM, THERE'S PEOPLE WATCHING THIS THINKING, WELL, NOW THAT'S UNJUST. YOU KNOW, WE AREN'T JESUS, AND WE CAN'T DO THOSE SAME THINGS THAT JESUS DID. AND THERE'S PEOPLE TODAY THAT RATHER THAN SIT THERE AND SAY THAT WE NEED TO COME UP TO A HIGHER LEVEL AND START REPRESENTING GOD BETTER, THERE'S PEOPLE THAT WOULD RESPOND TO ME AS SAYING, YOU'RE CONDEMNING THEM. AND IF JESUS WOULD HAVE BEEN HERE, HE WOULD HAVE JUST PUT HIS ARM AROUND HIM AND SAID, GUYS, IT'S OKAY. YOU KNOW, YOU'RE DOING THE BEST YOU CAN. YOU'RE GROWING. KEEP AT IT AND JUST ENCOURAGE THEM. I ACTUALLY HAD A PASTOR ONE TIME THAT WAS GOING TO START A SERIES ON HEALING AND HE INVITED ME OUT TO EAT BECAUSE HE KNEW I TAUGHT ON HEALING A LOT AND HE WANTED TO GET MY INPUT AND HE WAS ASKING ME SOME QUESTIONS. AND ONE OF THE QUESTIONS WAS, IS WHY DON'T PEOPLE GET HEALED? AND I SAID, WELL, THERE'S MULTIPLE REASONS. IT'S NOT ALWAYS SIMPLE, BUT I SAID, ONE OF THE REASONS IS THEY JUST DON'T HAVE FAITH. THEY DON'T BELIEVE GOD. AND HE GOT REALLY UPSET. HE SAID, I WOULD NEVER SAY THAT. I WOULD NEVER TELL A PERSON THAT THEY DON'T HAVE ENOUGH FAITH OR THAT THEY, they WEREN'T BELIEVING GOD. THAT IS JUST SO CONDEMNING AND, and uh, I WOULD BE POSITIVE AND STUFF. AND THAT VERY SUNDAY, I WENT TO HIS CHURCH AND HE READ THIS EXACT PASSAGE OF SCRIPTURE RIGHT HERE AND LOOK HOW JESUS RESPONDED WHEN HIS DISCIPLES COULDN'T CAST OUT THE DEVIL. JESUS ANSWERED AND SAID UNTO THEM, O FAITHLESS, AND PERVERSE GENERATION, HOW LONG SHALL I BE WITH YOU? HOW LONG SHALL I SUFFER YOU? BRING HIM HITHER TO ME. SO THIS PASTOR WHO PASTORED THOUSANDS OF PEOPLE SAID, I WOULD NEVER SAY ANYTHING LIKE THAT. IT MIGHT OFFEND SOMEBODY. IT MIGHT HURT SOMEBODY AND THINGS. IN A SENSE, HE'S TRYING TO BE MORE CHRIST-LIKE THAN CHRIST. HE'S TRYING TO OPERATE MORE PITY AND SYMPATHY AND MERCY AND KINDNESS THAN JESUS OPERATED IN. WHEN JESUS' DISCIPLES COULD NOT CAST OUT THIS DEVIL, HE SAID, YOU FAITHLESS AND PERVERSE GENERATION. HOW LONG AM I GOING TO BE HERE? IN OTHER WORDS, HE DIDN'T SAY, WELL, GUYS, IT WAS MY FAULT. I WAS UP ON THE MOUNTAIN. I SHOULD HAVE BEEN HERE. DON'T FEEL BAD. YOU JUST KEEP YOURSELF ENCOURAGED. AND, and NO, HE TOLD THEM, HE SAYS, YOU AREN'T DOING WHAT I HAVE ORDAINED YOU TO DO. HE WAS NOT PLEASED. AND I CAN TELL YOU, THE LORD IS NOT PLEASED WITH OUR INABILITY TO MEET THE NEEDS OF PEOPLE TODAY. I DON'T BELIEVE HE HATES US. HE'S NOT GOING TO JUDGE US. IF YOU ARE TRULY BORN AGAIN, GOD'S JUDGMENT HAS BEEN PLACED UPON JESUS, BUT THAT DOESN'T MEAN THAT HE, he ENDORSES AND VALIDATES AND APPROVES OF THE WAY WE'RE OPERATING ON. NO, THE CHURCH IS SUPPOSED TO BE MINISTERING TO THE NEEDS OF PEOPLE. BUT IF YOU HAD THE AVERAGE SICK PERSON TODAY 
GO INTO A PASTOR OF THE AVERAGE CHURCH. NOW, THERE'S SOME GREAT CHURCHES WHERE THEY PRAY FOR THE SICK AND MIRACLES HAPPEN AND THINGS, BUT I'M SAYING THE AVERAGE CHURCH TODAY AROUND THE WORLD, IF YOU HAD A PERSON WITH A TERMINAL DISEASE, GO TO THE PASTOR AND ASK FOR PRAYER. THE AVERAGE PASTOR WOULD SAY, WELL, WHY DID YOU COME TO ME? YOU KNOW, GO TO THE DOCTOR. HAVE YOU TRIED THIS TREATMENT? YOU NEED TO TRY THIS. AND I READ THIS ABOUT THIS HOLISTIC APPROACH, AND WE WOULD SEND THEM SOMEPLACE ELSE. THE LORD SAYS, BRING HIM UNTO ME. YOU SHOULD BE MEETING THIS NEED. IF THE AVERAGE PERSON COMES TO A PASTOR, THE AVERAGE PASTOR, AND THEY HAVE A FINANCIAL NEED, THE AVERAGE PASTOR WOULD SAY, WELL, HAVE YOU APPLIED FOR THIS GOVERNMENT PROGRAM? MAYBE YOU COULD GO TAKE OUT A LOAN. AND YET THE BODY OF CHRIST SHOULD BE TEACHING PEOPLE THE LAWS OF PROSPERITY AND HOW THEY WORK. IF THE AVERAGE PERSON CAME TO THE AVERAGE PASTOR TODAY WITH A MENTAL ISSUE, SOME KIND OF PSYCHOLOGICAL ISSUE, THE AVERAGE PASTOR WOULD SAY, WELL, YOU NEED TO GO TO A PSYCHIATRIST. YOU NEED TO TRY THIS, uh, YOU KNOW, uh, PILL AND DO THESE KIND OF THINGS. THE CHURCH ISN'T EVEN AS A WHOLE, THE CHURCH AS A WHOLE ISN'T EVEN SEEKING TO MEET THE NEEDS OF PEOPLE. AND LET ME JUST PROPOSE TO YOU THAT THAT'S ONE REASON THAT THE VAST MAJORITY OF PEOPLE DON'T GO TO CHURCH BECAUSE THE CHURCH SOMEHOW OR ANOTHER HAS WITHDRAWN FROM MEETING PHYSICAL NEEDS, FINANCIAL NEEDS, EMOTIONAL NEEDS, AND ALL THE CHURCH IS REPRESENTING, THE AVERAGE CHURCH IS ONLY REPRESENTING ABOUT HEAVEN AND HELL ISSUES. AND SO THE AVERAGE PERSON BELIEVES THAT THERE IS A HEAVEN AND A HELL. THEY BELIEVE THAT THERE IS LIFE AFTER DEATH, BUT THEY DON'T GO TO CHURCH BECAUSE THAT'S ALL FOR THE HEREAFTER. AND THEY'RE LIVING IN THE PRESENT, AND THEY DON'T SEE THE, re the RELEVANCE OF THE CHURCH TO THEIR DAILY LIFE. BUT IF WE WERE WALKING IN THE FULL GOSPEL AND, and MINISTERING THE WAY THAT GOD WANTED US TO, WE WOULD BE HEALING THE SICK, CLEANSING THE LEPERS, RAISING THE DEAD. WE WOULD BE TEACHING PEOPLE HOW TO PROSPER FINANCIALLY. WE WOULD BE SHOWING PEOPLE HOW TO HAVE JOY UNSPEAKABLE AND FULL OF GLORY, TO WALK IN LOVE, JOY AND PEACE, ETC. AND MAN, WE WOULD BE MEETING PEOPLE'S DAILY NEEDS IN SUCH A WAY THAT THEY WOULD RECOGNIZE THAT CHRISTIANITY ISN'T JUST FOR ETERNITY. IT'S THE BEST WAY TO LIVE IN THIS LIFE RIGHT NOW. BUT AS A WHOLE, THE CHURCH ISN'T DOING THAT. AND JESUS WASN'T PLEASED WITH HIS DISCIPLES' INABILITY TO MEET THE NEEDS OF THIS FATHER WITH HIS SON. AND JESUS ISN'T PLEASED WITH OUR INABILITY TODAY TO MEET THE NEEDS. WE SEND PEOPLE TO EVERY PLACE ELSE, AND THE ONLY REASON TO COME TO CHURCH IS JUST SO THAT YOU CAN GET RIGHT WITH GOD BEFORE YOU DIE. SO A LOT OF PEOPLE ARE WAITING UNTIL THEY DIE TO GET RIGHT WITH GOD, BUT THEY DON'T SEE ANY BENEFIT TO SERVING HIM NOW. THAT IS WRONG. JESUS WASN'T PLEASED WITH THAT THEN. HE'S NOT PLEASED WITH IT NOW. SO HE SAID, YOU FAITHLESS AND PERVERSE GENERATION, HOW LONG SHALL I BE WITH YOU? HOW LONG SHALL I SUFFER YOU? BRING HIM HITHER TO ME. AND THIS SHOWS THAT JESUS EXPECTED THESE DISCIPLES TO DO THIS. LIKEWISE, JESUS EXPECTS US TODAY TO MEET THE NEEDS OF PEOPLE. MAN, THAT'S POWERFUL. I COULD MINISTER ON THAT A LOT LONGER. AND SO ANYWAY, they, JESUS uh, HAD THE FATHER BRING HIS SON TO HIM, AND HE REBUKED THE DEMON. AND I'M OUT OF TIME TODAY. I'LL HAVE TO FINISH THIS ON MY PROGRAM TOMORROW. REMEMBER THAT FRIDAY IS GOING TO BE MY LAST DAY TO TEACH ON THIS AND OFFER THIS PRODUCT OVER TELEVISION. THIS IS A BOOK THAT I HAVE. IT'S ONLY ABOUT A 92-PAGE BOOK ON HARDNESS OF HEART BUT IT IS POWERFUL. I PROMISE YOU, IT COULD LITERALLY CHANGE YOUR LIFE. I ALSO HAVE THIS TEACHING IN CD FORM AND IN DVD THAT WAS TAKEN FROM OUR TELEVISION PROGRAM. AND uh, FRIDAY IS GOING TO BE MY LAST DAY TO OFFER THESE PRODUCTS. I PROMISE YOU, THIS WOULD CHANGE YOUR LIFE. YOU'RE GOING TO HEAR THINGS. YOU'RE GOING TO START UNDERSTANDING THINGS, SEEING THINGS FROM A DIFFERENT WAY. This is called the Summer Family Bible Conference. Guess what? That's not just because you brought your kids. It's because in this room, we're family. There's nobody in here that God doesn't want to prosper. He sees a purpose in you that he wants to set free. Listen, you've been sowing, sowing, sowing. It's time for us to reap our harvest. It's going to completely change the way that you live your life. Andrew's complete series titled Hardness of Heart is available in either a CD or DVD album and a book in either English or Spanish. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. 
Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. You can get these products as part of the Hardness of Heart package, which includes both books and your choice of either CD or DVD albums from both Hardness of Heart and How to Become a Water Walker. The Hardness of Heart package has a catalog value of $75, but you can receive all of these valuable resources for just $55. Andrew's book, Hardness of Heart, is also available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give because there's a blessing in giving. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this book to you free of charge. There are still millions more out there seeking the truth that set us free. You can reach people like me who are trapped in their home and not aware of the fullness of what the gospel says, that we can be free from everything the enemy tried to put on us. I would not be here if it wasn't for this ministry. Become a partner today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. In the month of April, Andrew will be joining Ashley and Carly Terrades in Colorado Springs for the Abundant Life event. Next, Andrew will be speaking in Brooklyn Park. And lastly in April, he'll again be in Woodland Park to host the Don't Limit God Conference with guest speaker Jesse Duplantis. In May, Andrew will be hosting our annual Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England, as well as two additional Grace and Faith Conferences in Woosh, Poland and Frankfurt, Germany. And in June, come to Woodland Park for the Truth and Liberty Coalition Conference. Joining Andrew at this event will be speakers James Robison, Mark Gonzalez, and Pastor Mark Coward. Then, from June 29th to July 3rd, Andrew will be in Woodland Park, Colorado, hosting the annual Summer Family Bible Conference. This event is loaded with activities for the whole family. Guest speakers will include Carrie Pickett, Bill Federer, Greg Moore, Billy Epperhart, Barry Bennett, Stephen Bransford, Paul Milligan, and Pastors Lawson Perdue and Mark Coward. And on the 4th of July, don't miss our special patriotic musical production titled in God We Trust. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net. Ready to get more out of God's Word than ever before? We gladly announce the Andrew Womack Living Commentary. This continuously updated Living Commentary is now available exclusively as a download for both Mac and Windows at awmi.net. 